Hi, and welcome to Talent Acquisition Trends and Strategy. I'm your host, James Mackey, and today we are joined by Mats Anderson. Mats, welcome to the call and the show. How are you doing? Thanks for having me, James. I'm, um, I'm, I'm good. Uh, pleasure to be here. Yeah, we're, we're happy to have you here. And um, I, I know, actually, before we jump into it, there's a few topics that I'm really excited to speak to, but uh, would you mind sharing a little bit about your, your background before we jump into it? Yeah, I, I, I can um, quickly share my background. So it, um, I started as a software engineer a long time ago back in Sweden, where I'm from. Uh, worked, um, moved quick, quite fast to Luxembourg, a uh, small country in Europe, where I worked for a clearinghouse there as developer, uh, project manager, different roles. We were acquired by the German Stock Exchange in Frankfurt. They wanted to set up a development center with lower costs. So back in 2007, I moved to Prague and uh, together with a German colleague, uh, started to build up their dev center there. We built it to 450 people over 10 years and uh, moved to US. Then I moved to the US two and a half years ago, just before the pandemic. I currently work for um, Uplift, agency so it's a consultancy company company in Colorado that is fully remote and I help them hiring um, hiring engineers to the team and I also run the Swedish American Chamber of Commerce here in San Francisco Silicon Valley very cool very cool and so I'm very excited to speak with you one one of the interesting insights that I I know you could bring to the table is that you started off as an engineer and then at some point made the transition into recruiting so I'm excited to to learn a little bit more about how that's shaped your perspective when it comes to hiring. Uh, but just just to jump into it, um, we'd love to know right now. Okay, you're hiring engineers for uh, engineering agency. Love to hear a little bit about what what you're seeing on the market. Um, how's it going in terms of being able to recruit top talent, top engineering talent, and a little bit about what seems to be working right now. What trends are you seeing out there? Well, so we, we hire at Uplift, we hire people from all over the world. So, uh, and, and I think the trend of applicants are, are, are clearly going up over the last months. Uh, so I don't know if it's because we are uh, advertising ourselves better or getting getting known, I don't know. Uh, but, but in general, there's a lot of good engineers out there. And uh, I, I think it's fascinating this, this aspect that people from all over the world now can work together so easily in, in, in a remote environment. That That is fascinating how well that can work and how many good engineers you have from everywhere. Um, for sure, for sure. And then from a recruiting standpoint, are you, are you all finding most of your hires through LinkedIn outbound or is it, it sounds like you're getting some inbound traction as well. Can you talk to us a little bit about the breakdown there, both domestically and internationally? Yeah, I mean, we, we, we use the traditional channels like LinkedIn, Indeed, AngelList, and, and uh, we get a lot of spontaneous applications as well. And, uh, well, breakdown, I think there's a loss. A lot of people from Southeast Asia, my major portion of, of uh, Uplift uh, contractors are, are, are US-based, but we have people in Southeast Asia, Europe, South America, Latin America. So it, it's, it's very, I mean, People, and a lot of people want to work for U.S. companies, so there's a lot of applicants coming from outside. And when we have a very formal process on on uh, to to select people, uh, which I think you, you need to have in your consultancy company, you need to be a little bit more uh, strict than when you hire for an in-house, where you can maybe test things out more. Because in the end, you place your um, your engineers with a client for most of the cases. Yeah, for sure. And would it be, is it accurate to say that for, so for instance, if you're uh, recruiting an APEC or in LADAM or EMEA, you're getting uh, more inbound, qualified inbound applications than in the U.S. market. So maybe is it more outbound sourcing in the U.S. market and more inbound internationally? Is that, is that an accurate statement? No, well, I, th I think it's, it's difficult to, to attract the senior US engineers that, that that is always a challenge to get the with five seven plus years so they, they are often uh, sit, sitting somewhere and it, it, it's difficult to, to get them but I think we have some, some of them but th there's a lot of with, with the I think the last years as well what you see in the trend a lot of people shifting uh, careers so uh, they did something and then they were laid off during the pandemic and then they, they did a boot camp and uh, now they're developers and maybe they were 
musicians or artists or hotel managers before. So, so you see a lot of juniors applying that has just recently graduated from a boot camp. Um, it, it's massive. I think the the shift in what what people took care, took responsibility for their own lives the last years. Yeah. For sure. So what do you so what do you all think about the boot camps? Like, does your agency hire people that don't have a lot of hands on experience, but went through one of these boot camps. I mean, I know a lot of companies, at least our clients, are really not interested in, in moving forward with junior talent, even if they come from a boot camp. They're really looking for uh, people that have worked in production environments, you know, push push things live. That seems to be pretty important to our client base, which is startups and growth stage tech companies primarily. Is that do you, do you all hire engineers that that come from the boot camps, or do you also look for the real life experience in addition to that? Yeah, we we do. We, the 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 real life experience is is important. But we we uh, interviewed and and uh, I, I think we have hired some from from boot coming from boot camps. But it's two three years of of uh, production experience is, is is important to have. But we're very open. I mean, we have a very big funnel in the beginning, so we're very open to kind of meet people, talk to them and, and give them a chance to do the, the code exercise and then take take it from there. And then in the end, it depends on what, if, if we have a client that is open to, to take on a junior, we are very open to do it. Uh, uh, and then we have some in-house projects as well. There are some products we, we do and there we have been um, taking on some more junior people that, that, that there is less of a risk for us and we can uh, kind of help them more because they need well, when you come from a boot camp and it, if you were a hotel manager before you need you need some supervision and some uh, some mentoring in the beginning so so we have done that for the internal projects yeah sure sure it's well i mean and for what we do so basically what we do is tech companies borrow recruiters from us so like you all essentially uh you know companies borrow engineers from you to some extent right i know that's an oversimplification but just to keep it simple, right? We kind of do that on the recruiting side. Um, and one thing that we've learned throughout the years is, okay, if we're going to hire somebody or team members that are a little bit more junior, we really have to make sure that we've optimized for the onboarding experience and the training and enablement to make sure that they can they can ramp quickly. Um, so is that something that you're seeing too? Is that an investment that you you are making where, okay, for the junior team members, we really have to focus on not only management oversight on an ongoing basis, but the first three months, making sure that they have the right resources in place to, to be successful? Yeah, to, totally. And also in, in my, my, my previous career, when, when, when I was hiring in Europe and building up teams there for, for the Deutsche Börse in, uh, in Prague, it, it, it's... Uh, you, you, it's vital that you have uh, that, that you help juniors coming in otherwise you set them up for failure so that that's super important to to pair them with a, a more senior senior engineer and and, and uh, give them guidance and and uh, be around them to support them yeah that, that's vital yeah I think that's for any any profession I mean you you need to help uh, juniors to, to but, and at the same time people are Smart people are are smart, so so people learn very fast if if they put in the right environment. I think. Yeah, yeah I agree. I think uh, one thing that I've learned over the years is that uh, the better your onboarding, training, enablement process, tech stack, right? I mean, the more that you have those things optimized, the more uh, able you are to bring on more junior talent, which means it's a, a wider talent pool, as well as at a lower cost. So. It really makes sense investing in those strategies to, to optimize onboarding experience, training and enablement process, tech, these types of things so that you can get the advantage of a bigger talent pool at, at better prices. Um, and I think the same holds true is actually for A players versus B players, right? Like when you don't have a lot of process enablement training uh, in place, you almost are forced to, you have to find that top 95 percentile candidate because they're not yeah. going to have a lot of support walking into the environment. Whereas, you know, if you have all the right training and enablement and process in place, it actually enables organizations to hire people that might be 80th percentile, right? Um, because they can thrive more in a structured environment. So that, that's another kind of interesting thing that I've seen just as well being on the agency side, like your team. Um, yeah, that, no, you know, totally. And I, I agree with that. And, and you need the 80% players as well you, if you i mean it's good to have a, a team of only 100 percent players but then in, in the end they, they 
they are often very also very demanding, so it will be more difficult to manage. So you need kind of you need a balance like in, in, in any team. Um, so to create the environment for, for growth is, is important. Uh, yeah, it's also just hard to achieve large scale when you only have the 95, 95th percentile, 100 percentile kind of people on your team. Like if you it just it's going to slow down hiring. It's going to push up salaries to an insane rate, which is going to mean you have to have even higher pricing to customers, right? Um, yeah, totally. So no, you you, you need to have you need to have a balance there be, be, between uh, people with with a little bit less of experience and a little bit less of cost, and and uh, and the seniors who who can yeah drive the the engine forward. Are you seeing any any trends? I mean, I I know remotes becoming probably more and more important to. To engineers, um, but are you seeing any other kind of trends in terms of what engineers are looking for? I mean, it could be something like really tactical, like a certain technology or certain industries, or like what what is really hot right now? What are what are like the most common questions you're getting from engineers that you're recruiting right now? Well, I think remote is is one of the big things. Um, I mean, Paul and Marius they, they started Uplift back in 2016 as a remote company, and I I. I don't know, but I think then that was more difficult than to be remote. But for I think for engineers, it, it's a dream to be remote. In general, they don't like too much of the meetings and, 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 and small talk and all these things happening in an office space, but there's exceptions. But uh, uh, so, so I think it, it's, it's a dream for them to be able to work when you want and, and uh, do it around. So, so that's clearly uh, why, why I think we get a lot of applicants. And also I think even if you're not that much into small talk and meetings, you want a inclusive, collaborative environment. Uh, uh, I think that's that's vital to have a, an environment where you, in the end, you work as a team. I think most people want to have that, but, but there is a good team atmosphere. And then with regards to tech stacks, I think that, that you can see different things. I think some, some engineers that I met over the year are um, seeing programming language is more in a religious way so they 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 can't see they, they they only believe in their language and some others sees it more as a tool to develop a product and they don't really care about that but in the end most want to be on the on the top of the the last whatever framework or language there is out there the nobody want to miss out and they they you have to spend a lot of time and energy to stay on top of that yeah, I bet. That's uh, I, I know that from, I mean, I actually, from a hands-on perspective, I didn't ever get too much into tech recruiting hands-on. Uh, I did some, I, I did engineers. I, you know, I did the networking infrastructure um, QA. So I, I have kind of, I've had some experience, but really when we started to do tech recruiting was when I was scaling out the organization and I brought on tech recruiters that, that were used to living in this world for, for years and years. So uh, but yeah, everything that you're saying sounds very familiar to me as well. I know one of the things too that a lot of our clients were looking for when it came comes to leads and managers was on more so on the communication side, and uh, you know that was one of the one of the reasons why I think some of the earlier stage startups were looking to to first grow domestic teams here in the U.S. just so there's no kind of communication breakdowns in the early days of product development, um, and maybe they just didn't have as much process built out. So I, I know that that was another big piece, just finding finding people that have it have it all, right? Like people that have the technical side and also have the communication, um, which is pretty hard to find. I don't know if you agree, but I, I remember that's for for some people to find uh, engineering managers and and directors. I know that that was always um, you know a challenge for a lot of the companies that uh, came to us on the recruiting side. Yeah, it is. Uh, so basically, I, I screen most of, of, of the candidates to check for you know, English and, and general communication and, and, and things like that. I'm, I, I'm not diving too deep into the, the, the technology, but it's more on, on, on the, it's got to be a, a person you want to work with and, and who can express themselves. Uh, hiring engineering managers, it, it, it's difficult from the outside, I think. It, it's uh, it, it's uh, when in my, my past role, we try to often grow them from inside. In, in general, I think that turns out to be better uh, with some exceptions, but um, no, it, it, it's, 
it's difficult to find uh, a person who also wanna um, who is good in, in leading and and wanna take time and because if you go into the management role you can't code as much that's that's for sure you you need to spend time with people you need to be interested in people to do that otherwise it, it won't work out that well i mean i think that's probably one of the most challenging parts too because if somebody's an engineer they a lot i'm, I'm assuming most of them probably want to stay hands-on and current with the latest technologies and continue to develop that technical skill set so i guess it's it is about finding the people that want to move into more of a leadership role that's more focused on people and they're comfortable with no longer quite as much advancing their technical skill set. I mean, they need to be aware of the latest, right? And, and they have to be current with it, but they're not going to be as diving into the tactics in the day-to-day, -day, right? Uh, yeah, no, totally. And and uh, yeah, I think it, it, uh, some people, where well, everyone has to make that choice at some point in time where, where, where they want to go further. I mean, not not even if you're a good good engineer and developer, you maybe you don't want to be that in in twenty years, and and maybe you want to do it. Uh, it it, um, um, it 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 I think it's a personal personal choice. But if you're into if you love people or like pe to talk with people, it, it it's a good chance of uh, yeah keeping yourself up to date and um, still be in the engineering world. Gotcha. So I just quick question about how Uplift operates. So I know it's an international company. I think you mentioned that um, at least one of the founders was uh, from Romania initially. I, how does the team go about structuring? So I, I, you know, assuming, I guess one question is, is most of the, the clients, are they in the US market that you service or do you service clients internationally? Most clients are in the US market. Okay. Yeah, and, and, and both, uh, both founders are from, from Romania. So it's two brothers, Paul and Marius from, from Romania. Cool. Um, yeah, so, but we are pretty flexible. So if, if the client is not putting any, some clients put, say that they want a candidate in the US, it could be for convenience reasons, or it could be for some legal reasons, then, then we hire in the US. If the client is flexible, we, we can hire from anywhere. So we, we get, yeah, we talk every day to people from all over the world, basically. Yeah. Is there any, in any kind of team structure? So for instance, you want to have team leads or managers in the U S or does it really just not matter at all? Like you'll take people at every level of the organization, anywhere where you get the best person. I mean, what does that look like? Well, I, ideally you, you want to have uh, team leads in the U S it, it's a little bit more, a uh, little bit easier. Time zone is a problem. So uh, I think Uplift is really flexible. Uh, they, we, we kind of expect four hours overlap a day uh, on, on US time zone. But it, in, in, if you're in a more lead role, it, it's, uh, I think, an advantage to be in the US, not for, for the time zone, if not for anything else. Yeah. Right. Time zone to, to communicate with leadership. Yeah. Right. Um, having that alignment with the, the leaders in the company can be really important. We, we are starting to, for, for my company, looking more into building international teams uh, for a couple of reasons. One, for blended rates, so we can bring down the cost of labor, um, you know, because we, at, you know, just like your team, we don't really care where people are based, right? Uh, we just want to open up the talent pool and, and be competitive there, too. Um, so we're considering it for that reason. And then the other reason, too, that's something interesting that I'm thinking about, particularly for supporting larger customers, enterprise customers, is if we can have team members in multiple time zones and we can get more work done in a day, it's like we have, you know, essentially we're working, you know, 18 to 20 hours a day, a lot more than if we're, if we're just operating in one time zone. So that's, that's been interesting too, to figure out how we can get uh, more done faster, um, open up the talent pool, have more so blended rates to bring down cost of labor. Um, all of those things are kind of contributing to us thinking about scaling international teams to support particularly again like larger customers right that are looking for five ten more people to support uh their company at any given time yeah no i think it, it, it's an excellent idea to do that one i think it's great to bring the world together um what what, what i think is important if you being bring build teams of five ten people you need someone making kind of the bridge um someone that you trust or that are close to you um so you you can't just hand off a, a bunch of work and then expect it to be done and uh, you you need some bridging people who who are between 
whatever client you have and 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 the, that team i think it's important uh, and it, it doesn't need to be much it could be one person who checks in an hour a day or whatever who, who knows the people you need to still to create some uh, environment where it felt feels like a team oh yeah I, I agree with you i mean i think for particularly for services companies there really needs to be several checks and balances in place to ensure quality control and ensure alignment and so for us we we essentially we have like a, a head of delivery that oversees um, you know the majority of our projects company wide, and then we also have a, a team lead layer as well, uh, and then we have the you know full individual contributor role, uh, and the head of delivery is either on the weekly calls with the client checking in, um, or the team lead is, or both of them are right. It just depends on the scope of the project, but we try to bake in a few layers of redundancy to ensure that. Uh, everybody's aligned on the same page. Performance is going to plan, right? We have like a few key metrics we're looking at as well. Um, but I agree with you. I think, yeah, I think having on, honestly, like everybody has to have clearly defined points of impact, but it's it's really beneficial to have a few people involved and know the client. Uh, for, for And for the other reason beyond like checks and balances, it's also good if, if somebody goes out of office, right? Or somebody leaves. And if you don't have a team lead or a head of, delivery that's engaged with that client, then the knowledge transfer becomes a nightmare where it's like, where do you, where does somebody pick up? So it's, it's good to have those layers of redundancy kind of built in where there's more eyeballs on it. So if somebody leaves the company or goes out of office for a prolonged period of time, you can essentially hopefully kind of more so plug in another great person on the team into that, into that project. And they're the knowledge transfer is much easier. They can get up to speed on the project and what's going on versus just simply assigning an individual contributor without having management leadership layers to communicate and help ensure that things go to plan. Yeah, totally. And I think that there comes the, the importance of building teams and not only having individual A players in, in the team, because I mean, if you have a good team, it doesn't really matter if someone goes off a right. couple of days, days or weeks. And, and I think also one important aspect, if you, if you uh, outsource to other parts of the world, you need to take into account the culture there. So you, so you, you, you must make sure you have a team where you have a, a fluid communication where people kind of, where, you, where they can trust you so they speak up because there, there, are, there are parts of the world where people won't necessarily say, oh, I have a problem. I don't understand this. They will, will it, it's, a, it, it's not in the culture. So if you don't have an environment where they can speak up, uh, you might end up with a problem that you didn't see come. Yeah, I think it's really important for leaders, particularly of service companies that employ people internationally to have experience running multicultural organizations, because you're right, there's a lot of nuance. And Particularly for instance, so we actually, we have a subsidiary in Romania too. I actually, I okay. lived in, in Bucharest for a year and a half. So uh, my daughter's half Romanian. So I, I'm, I'm very, <laughs> I, oh, I'm, nice. I'm, I'm all the way in on, on the Romanian culture. I spent a lot of time there. got a lot of love for, for people in Bucharest and, and got a lot of friends and family there. So, um, you know, but one of the things I noticed is the culture is obviously drastically different than the American culture, right? You know, we're, we're loud and <laughs> direct and, you know, we're, you know, we might be a lot more outspoken um, where, you know, our, our team members and other parts of the world, like for instance, like Romania, for example, um, you know, they're going to, they're going to handle conversations completely different ways. They may not speak up when it comes to certain things. They, uh, there's just different things. You have to be able to facilitate conversations in a way that certain cultures like to communicate and have. I, I guess been, you know, communicating it throughout their lifetime. And, and that's definitely been a lesson learned for us is, is making sure to, to, to facilitate those conversations. And, you know, we might, we might have, it's like situational leadership, right? That too. Yeah, it's like no. how we kind of manage and lead the U S team might be different than EMEA might be different than APAC. And you have to, you have to take a situational approach. It's, it, and also that comes down to the people functions too. Like when it comes to benefits and perks and what people want, right? I mean, what somebody wants yeah. in, in general in America might be totally different than what people want in Eastern Europe. And you can't just, you got to, you got to approach each region differently to make sure that you're, 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 you're providing good experiences for employees in different parts of the world. Yeah, no, that, that, that's so, it, it's so true. 
the, to take a situational approach, you, you, you need to do it. And it's very difficult because sometimes you don't have the, the knowledge of, of, of the culture or, or, or the people. I mean, uh, I think Sweden, uh, I'm not an expert on Romanian culture, but I know, and, and I know very well Czech, French, uh, Swedish and uh, German culture. And, and for example, in Sweden, not people won't necessarily, will not necessarily, they don't, we, even if they don't agree with you, they will not necessarily speak up. Right. Uh, so, uh, and, and for an American, that will be a sign like, yeah, they didn't say anything, so they agreed. But it's not necessarily true. So you, th then th th there's limits on how much you can accommodate everyone as well. I mean, everybody has to, 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 to try to adapt to the, the environment, but it, it's so important to take this into account. And also what, what you mentioned there with uh, what people expect, it could be that they, they could be so different if, it, if it's just an employment or a salary or, or just a challenge, you have no clue if you don't try to dig into it a little bit. Yeah, it's, it's funny. We've had certain situations with clients where we'll have like an Israeli customer and we have U.S. and uh, Romanian uh, team members supporting the customer, and everybody's coming from a different style of communication. And again, just that it's just so important to have a leader, uh, like a head of delivery that is used to working in these multicultural environments. So I, yeah, I agree. I think we're speaking the same language here because it's just it's so incredibly important. And the one thing that I learned about like w working with our Romanian team is if you don't fully understand the culture, like it's also okay to ask. Like, it's okay to just say like, Hey, how can, we, how do you think we should run these meetings to get the most out of this? How do you feel like we should be communicating going through this? And I mean, you can sometimes just ask and, and I've, I've learned a lot uh, about different cultures just by, by simply just saying like, Hey, like if we're recruiting in this market, how do we reach out to candidates? Like in the U S it's, you know, we're very best in class, uh, disruptive. It's a lot of buzzy stuff, right? Just talking up. But if you were to do that, for instance, in Romania, people are going to be like, you're, this is why are you, yeah. it's too much. It's too much. Just, you know, dial it back a little bit. And, and so it's, you have to have those different approaches. And, and a lot of times you're not going to learn unless you start just asking those questions. Right. Um, so I try to, I no, try to it, ask as much as I can. It, yeah. It's a good approach. I mean, in general, people are always open to that. So you can always uh, ask and set, set expectations from up, up from the beginning. It, it, it's a good thing that is open. It's an easy and quick small thing to do but often forgotten <laughs> for sure yeah. for sure yeah you know i i just from a leadership perspective i'm of the mindset of you know to some extent you can't scale relationships like you know you can have all the surveys in the world but a lot of the times the best insight that you're going to get is just from getting in there and talking with people and and creating like deep like human connections and asking asking these types of questions right it's 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 they're not necessarily going to give you that feedback in a survey right no, uh, they, they they won't, and and they will be suspicious about the survey in general. Most uh, A people are so, uh, you, yeah. You got to create these uh, relations, uh, and it, it's fascinating to do that. It is. It's it's part of the. It's part of the. It's it's very rewarding. It's it's a lot yeah. more fun and interesting, and and I think it's it's also beneficial to organizations to have people coming from different cultures and perspectives, fresh ideas, creativity. Just there's a lot of things that can flow. Um, as long as you have a leader that can bring people together and help them communicate, there's there's a lot of benefits to having people coming from um, diverse perspectives. Yeah, no, I I think you the the ultimate product or or business will thrive from that. I I I'm I'm convinced too. For sure. Hey, I have a question for you though. So you you were living in Prague for a while, right? Yeah, I lived twelve years in Prague. Yeah. Oh, okay. That's so. I was there for about probably five months in total. Okay. And I absolutely love that city. It's fantastic. Yeah, it, it's uh, it's amazing. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. I would actually. I'm still thinking about it. I want one day in the future, maybe buying a place there. I just had such a great time. Yeah, I know. And also, they they have fantastic engineers coming out. They, they, I mean, during the communist regime, I think the the schools were built up to be really good, and they've been continuing to be good. So they have really good um, engineers, both from uh, Czechs and Slovaks, and. Uh, yeah, the, the town is fantastic. The environment, I, I, I love it. I, I never managed to learn to speak Czech, even if I was there 12 years, unfortunately, but uh, it, it's, it's, you can get around. 
great yeah. place, great place to be. Yeah. yeah. I never learned the language. I mean, I was only there five months, but I, yeah. <laughs> I did not get very far. I got a few words in, but that was, that was about it. But uh, were you, were you in recruitment uh, when you were working over there? What, what were you doing at that point in time? So I, I was managing director. I was, we were two managing directors for Deutsche Börse. So we were, um, yeah. So I was basically building up their teams and I was, we had, we were delivering software to the Frankfurt Stock Exchange and also to the clearing house in Luxembourg. And um, so I was, we had a very developed matrix organization. So basically I was, um, me and my colleague, Michael, we were hiring people and then helping managing them, building up teams, building up knowledge. So, and um, then a lot of, lot of collaboration with the teams in Luxembourg and Frankfurt. Uh, it was also it was a fantastic time too. Love nice. that. Yeah. Yeah. That sounds like a, a lot of fun. Were you primarily recruiting in Czech Republic or was it internationally? Well, we started, we started to recruit in Czech Republic, but then it grew. So in the end we had, I think we had 25 different nationalities. So we hired nice. in, Prague is really a hub where people come uh, for various reasons. So we, and for example, main, we, we needed to find mainframe developers at that time. Couldn't find that in Europe. So we, we hired people from India, young engineers from India, and flew them over to Prague, and uh, they they now live there and uh, uh, did did very well. So um, yeah, in the end, and even U.S., Canada, people come people come to Prague. It's it's a uh, it's the center of Europe. It's a great place. I'm <laughs> still is, waiting yeah. to land a big uh, project in Prague, so I can I have an excuse to. To, to go out there and, and, and it's a, it's a business trip, but I, I, mean, I just want to go to Prague. I want yeah. to start getting clients in different regions where I just want to travel to. Like, yeah, that, that would a, be great. I, like I just, think it sounds like a good plan. <laughs> I'm going to open an office in Nice, like South of France. You know, I want to, I just, I don't even know, <laughs> yeah. but I'm just kidding. But you know, it'd be cool to have all these cool destinations to go to one day. Yeah. And go to Sweden, <laughs> Sweden in the, in the summer, preferably summer. Yeah. <laughs> Very nice, I would love yeah. to. Yeah. I will get there one of these days. Yeah. Um, well, look, this is this has been a, a ton of fun. I, I want to thank you again for for coming on the the show today, um, and and just uh, for contributing and, and sharing your knowledge and insight with the with the audience today. Ah, thank you so much. It was a great pleasure. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank and you. by the way, for for people that want to connect with you, where can they find you online? Well, easiest to connect me. Drop me a mail at mats m a t s at uplift dot ltd all right good stuff well Matt, thank you for joining us and for everybody else tuning in thanks and we'll see you next time take care thank you